Record. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR. Cavanis HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Paul June. Paul, are you ready to be great today? Yeah. Paul is a serial entrepreneur, United States Air Force veteran. He served as an intelligence officer, and, I, and, come, and upon completing his service, he moved to the film industry where he worked as director of sales and acquisitions at Covert Media, UCSD and CSUF MBA alum. And Paul can say what those acronyms mean. He co founded a film of Crossy. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that wrong. To help democratize the imbalance of power in the, in the entertainment center, in the entertainment industry. Paul, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. So, Paul, talk about your experience being in the military. Yeah, it was, it was interesting for me because um, I did ROTC during college. I was largely directionless for the first few years, and then I found ROTC and joined late. And when you're in ROTC, which is, uh, I did it at UCSD, UC San Diego, and you, they instill in you like a lot of these feelings that you are going to be an agent of change and the future in leadership, because you're an officer and then you get in and you're like a lowly lieutenant and nobody cares what you think. And they just tell you to shut up. So, um, basically the army is the same way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a rude awakening. And I, I realized that in order to have any like real influence, it was going to take a career. And so in the short time that I did spend in the military, I, I learned a lot in terms of leadership, uh, and, following orders and generally being a good airman. Um, and it was something that I would never take back. I learned so much from it. It, it impacted my growth as a person so much, um, but definitely outgrew it um, as my career went forward. And I felt like I wanted to do something on my own. Do you, do you get to travel, like go out the side of the States or you stationed in the States the whole time? States the whole time. Okay. And, and what, you were an intelligence officer in the Air Force? Yes, intelligence. And so when you left the military, you became, you went to sales. And like I said in a pre-talk, most people don't go to sales, right? They run away from it. What made you want to become involved with sales? Just your personality or your extrovert or just something captivated you about being in sales? Um, I mean, I don't actually like sales. I just, you know, sales is life. You know, life is selling things and convincing people to believe in you, convincing people that they need something. Uh, so it's something I do out of obligation because what really drives me is creativity. And if you're making things, you have to teach those people about those things and, and show them why it's important. And so sales goes along with the process. So you were in sales, like, did you just learn sales on yourself? Did somebody train you or how did you learn to do sales? Um, I think it's just over time. Like I was extremely introverted when I was younger. And then just over time, having different jobs of like working in student loans and, you know, selling people on consolidating their loans, uh, working at telemarketing companies. And then over time, you just sort of numb yourself to awkwardness or rejection. And then you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's a myth that, you know, most salespeople like, you know, used car salesmen, extroverted, hard sales. But it seemed like most successful salespeople like actually like kind of like introvert, like they listen to the customer wants versus forcing something down their throat. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Like as we get older, I think we quickly pick out people that we know are, are full of it and, you know, aren't really good people. And the people that are genuinely nice and listen to you and try to help you, those are the people we gravitate towards. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. The older you get, the, the more your BSIS meter is actually accurate. Yes. Exactly. before. So talk some about your, your company. So um, before I started my company, I worked in film uh, as a sales and acquisitions executive, buying and selling movies, going to all these fancy film festivals and partying with celebrities, but um, good, good times. I'm yeah, sure. it was a great job. But over the past 10 years, the film industry has changed a lot. And the way that a lot of these mid 10 to $50 million budget films were made has gone away. So you have this rise of a lot of really big studio movies like the Marvels and the Jurassic Parks, Fast and Furious. And then you have this huge influx of sub 
three million dollar movies because just everything is cheaper. Software is cheaper, equipment's cheaper, accessing talent is cheaper, and you also have the simultaneous growth of the global film economy. So every other country now is making such high quality films. Um, so there's just a, an overall surplus of movies, which means you're gonna have a lot of people who feel left out. Um, they're not gonna make it in Hollywood and their films very often end up on YouTube or Vimeo or on a hard drive somewhere because after they do their festival run, there's nothing to do. So Democracy is a company that I made to help these people, the people that may have made a great film, but they didn't have a big cast or a big enough budget and just there's no market opportunity for them. So Paul, I think most people don't realize that, in, that you actually have to sell your movie. Can you talk a little bit about how the movie sales work? So like most people think, oh, a movie's made, it goes, you know, AMC or whatever the movie theaters are, not, are known, you know, but it's actually, you have to actually sell the movie, right? I don't think people realize that. How's that process work? Yeah, I mean, that'd be great if you just went to AMC after making a movie, <laughs> but it's a whole long process. And the reason movies are so valued, I think is because like, they can turn out incredible with a lot of hard work and they can also be a total disaster with a lot of resources. And it's almost like it's so many people's hands in this cookie jar trying to make this big production that so many things can go wrong or it can be like culturally shifting. And so normally how it works if you want to sell your movie, get it distributed, is you will hire a sales agent like what I used to do. And basically, I will take your film and I'll go to all of the buyers internationally and domestically and I'll say, hey, I've got this movie with Jason Kavnes. He's going to be the next Tom Cruise. And it's about you know, a guy who falls out of an airplane and grows wings. So I'm like selling it. I'm pitching it to them. And they say, OK, yeah, that sounds cool. You have a trailer? I say, sure, yeah, here's a trailer or a promo. It's called a sizzle reel because it's not actually the film made yet. It's just like a hypothetical version of what the film could be like. And so I sell them your movie for a certain amount of money and I do that country by country. And then they go out and they have relationships with all of the theaters in their countries and they exhibit. Okay. So there's a lot of people in between from production to you seeing it at AMC. So for every movie, like we'll say successfully, so how many movies don't make it or are not so, so to speak? Oh my God, like more than a hundred times more. Wow. Maybe even a thousand times more. Because now like you can make movies on your phone and if you do it right, you kind of can't tell anymore. It used to require like big cameras and big crews and special lighting equipment and special booms which are like the microphones so now you have like smaller equipment and you can like shoot anywhere you can be really mobile in your production so you just have like way more stuff that's like good quality but has people you don't know in them so buyers generally don't want that content because yeah. if i have to take a movie with jason Kavnes and buy out a billboard with your face on it as handsome of a guy you are nobody knows who you are yeah, yeah in the film world so yeah. seeing that billboard has no impact on me but if i drive by and there's like brad pitt on a billboard it doesn't even matter what the movie is i'm like oh brad pitt has a new movie coming out and so i will instinctively be able to like know there's a, a brad pitt movie coming and this is the value of stars this is why they're so valuable internationally too is because their face just plastered on anything immediately draws attention and correlates with box office success. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. Yeah, because what is it? Like everyone's a content creator now, right? Everyone has a YouTube channel, everyone's making movies, or at least attempting to make movies anyway, right? Yeah. So what's the process of someone putting a film on your platform? How does that come about? Is the application process or I mean it's just a submission form and it can even be as simple as just sending us an email with a screener link. Because we are really trying to make it as straightforward and direct as possible because in the film industry it's a very predatory industry because this is the industry of dreams and so whenever there's an industry like that you have 
other people who come to take advantage of those people. So we try to cut out all of that. Just send us a link. We don't charge you. We'll watch the movie. Um, we do get a lot of submissions, so it may take us a while to get to your film, but we will go through it. That's, that's something that's important to me. Because so I'll, do, you, do you watch the whole movie? No. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's no time. There's yeah. no time. I'll, I'll, I'll watch the beginning and like skip through and make sure some beats are hitting and everything sounds and looks good. Um, but I'll tell you an interesting thing about entertainment is there's, I was getting scripts mailed to our office, solicitations, nicely bound, like heavy 120 page cover letter. Someone's like heart and soul went into packaging this, this script. And we get them all the time. And so I receive the script. Well, the mail person receives the script. They bring it to me. And then I tell them, I told you to stop bringing those to me Put in the trash because there's no time. Yeah. There's no time to read that script because I have agencies, I have studios, I have other people who already have the talent in place, the financing in place, potentially even distribution in place already, like fully packaged projects. So why I, I don't have time to make your dreams come true <laughs> when there's other dreams that are already like halfway there. Yeah, understood. So do you show like all type of genres, all ratings, like you show like comedies, sci-fi, drama? G, P, G, R, the whole, so. Yeah, we, we do shorts, features, documentaries, series, animation. We don't do any music videos. Um, I just feel like that's something else. So we don't mess with that, but we try to keep it as open as possible. Is there a time limit on the movies that y'all take? No, we have a movie that's a minute long. Oh, wow. And the way that our revenue works is um, basically, we tabulate all of the minutes your content is consumed and then make a proportion out of the total minutes. And whatever your proportion is, you earn that much of the 50% of the pie. And, and speaking of revenue, I saw on your website, you have like a revenue share model for your, for your users. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, so we generate revenue from ads and subscriptions. 50% of the revenue generated goes into a pool. And all of the films share that 50% piece, depending on how many minutes out of the total they were watched that month. So it's not by per click. It's not by like per completed film. It's if somebody watched three minutes of your movie, then you're going to get paid three minutes worth compared to everybody else. If someone puts a movie on your platform, are they eligible to like do, do Oscars and Academy Awards and stuff like that? No. Okay. No, I mean, even like Netflix had a lot of trouble with that because yeah. the awards demand like a theatrical run. And okay. we obviously don't have any theaters that we work with to do that. And are you like Destiny United States or across the world? Across the world. I think that's one of our advantages is usually films will get broken up. Uh, their rights will be broken up by country. Um, but for us, most of these films don't have distribution anywhere. So they can come to us for worldwide. So if a movie like say a married made in America is made in English and they get sent to us, say to um, Japan, how does that get trans how does that get translated? Is it subtitles on the bottom or does somebody actually go through and translate each word? Or how does that I always wonder how that works? Yeah, it, it depends on the country. Like in Germany, for example, there are like each famous actor has like their German equivalent who does all of their dubbing. And so like you'll grow up in Germany thinking that Tom Cruise sounds a certain way because it's the same every time he has a movie, but then that's just his like German equivalent voice dub. But then like, for example, in Poland, you have one person who's kind of dubbing the entire movie, almost like narrating, um, like reading all the parts themselves. So it's, and like, it's, it's normal to Polish people. My wife is Polish and she tells me about this. She's like, yeah, that's normal. It's, this is how we grow up. The only dubs that get multiple people with different parts is like children's movies. But for like adult movies, it's just one person <laughs> reading the whole script. And, and you get, I'm, I'm assuming you get like film inputs from like all over the world from different countries. Yeah, we really pride ourselves on that. There's so much good international content. And that's because 
around the world, the different governments support their filmmakers with grants and scholarships and things like that. But here in the US, it's very commercial and there's no like real government support for filmmakers. When you get a movie submitted to you, can you pretty much tell if it's gonna be a good movie or successful movie based on the content? Usually, yes. But there are some movies that are, they have like interesting qualities about them that I may not catch immediately. Um, and sometimes we'll miss those, uh, which I apologize for, but I just, I'm trying to get through as many as I can. So. And who else watches the movies with you? Cause I'm sure you're not doing this by yourself. You have like a team, like a committee of film reviewers. Y'all sit down like once a week and go through like a dozen movies at one time and knock it out. How you do that? Yeah, we have a acquisitions team. Uh, we also have a lot of interns going through films, film interns. And we used to have a Facebook group called the Curation Committee, where I would just send them links of things and see what they thought. But um, <clears throat> they're a bit harsh, in my opinion. So <laughs> they've slowly stopped using that group. Okay. So speaking of interns, like how do you go about bringing on interns? You just, I mean, LA has a lot of film people, I'm, I'm presuming. So is it pretty easy to bring on interns to work for you? How's that process go? Yeah, it's pretty easy. You have film departments in every college and you know, breaking into Hollywood is such a hard thing to do with so much gatekeeping that there's plenty of people who want to intern to get their foot in the door. So we work a lot with USC and Columbia to get interns, but we're generally open for everyone. Okay. And like when you get a movie, are you able to tell, look, this movie is gonna do good in Poland it won't go to do good in Japan. Can you kind of tell what countries you might be able to do good in and not good, do good in, so to speak? We don't have enough data yet. You know, we've okay. been live for two and a half months now. I mean, we've been building it for two years, but we only like officially, officially went live about two and a half months ago. So the data is still coming in. Um, but the unique thing I think about our platform is that we have this rating system that is very different from others. Normally it's like out of five stars, what'd you think? But for us, we're asking you to actually break it down by how's the plot, how's the dialogue, how's the cinematography. And then based on that, we calculate your score relative to the average. And if you're way off, we reward you less. And if you're very close, we reward you more. So essentially what we're asking you is not necessarily what you, Jason, thought of the movie. We're asking what you think the general consensus is on the plot. Okay. What is the general consensus of the dialogue? because this is closer to what is more applicable to everybody else. I understand that everyone has their own personal opinions about things and they are important and you're a snowflake, but it's important that we get rid of any sort of biases you might have personally and try to get closer to what the actual quality metric of the film is. And your platform, can you watch on like a mobile or this, or this desktop right now? Mobile and desktop. Um, the reason we haven't made any apps yet is because each time you have another app, you have to update that individual app every time you update the platform. So if we have 50 apps, there's like, you need a team like handling all of those separate platforms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, unfortunately. <laughs> so let's, for an example, like for every 100 people that watch a movie, how many of them actually like, like give you their feedback? Over 70%. Oh, wow, that's, that's great. We try to make it as easy as possible. So like when you pause the movie and when the movie ends, it just pops up automatically and you're just picking out a five stars for these different categories. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's 70%, that's outstanding. So I'm, 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 I'm reading something off your LinkedIn profile real fast that I really liked. So give me just a second. So Paul's profile he put, with the, with the extraordinary amount of information that we in the 21st century have access to, there is no limit to the amount of hobbies, interests, professional pursuits, and dreams we can achieve. The right balance of time and passion, the sky is truly the limit to our endeavors. I, I, really, I really like that quote right there from you. So the question for you is, right, why do so many people not do this? Uh, I'm going to answer your question as soon as you show back up because you disappeared from the screen. Do you see, do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Your screen says press yeah, I got it. button. Yeah. So cool. on, off the topic, right? So I started live streaming this 
And so I bought this camcorder. I mean, like a, a camera, right? A live streaming camera. I just found out like a couple of days ago that it cuts off for 30 minutes, right? Mm-hmm. And, and of course, you know this for the people don't out there. So mirrorless or DSL cameras with a live stream, it cuts off 29.5 minutes because over that is classified as a video camera in the EU and the EU charges like five, five to 12% tariff, which of course I didn't know before <laughs> I spent all the money on the camera, right? So now I'm like, oh. So annoying. Yeah. Yeah, so the quote, I actually wrote that uh, many years ago, but yeah, I think a lot of people don't, don't do a lot of different things because it's so easy to fill your time with anything else, social media, meeting with friends, like all of these big corporations like Facebook and Google, like they're incentivized to steal your time, that this is a time economy. They want as much of it as possible. And they're very good at getting you to keep looking at your feed or keep swiping left or swiping right. It's all like psycho based on psychological principles. So it's very easy, I think, to fall into this sort of like comfort zone of like, oh yeah, good work, um, like eat dinner maybe, and like just go on my phone and like maybe turn on Netflix. These are all huge corporations that have psychologically figured out like we can get you to do what we want you to do watch Netflix, order food from Postmates, stay on Instagram while you're watching the movie, maybe go on Tinder when you get bored of the movie and then go to sleep. And then they just repeat the cycle. And so like getting out of that is pretty hard and it's pretty scary, especially if you've never done it before, like starting something new. It's very easy to like say, I'm gonna learn something, but actually executing that is so hard. Like I'm learning to play ukulele now and I I have it right next to my computer. And I play probably like 10 minutes a day, but then sometimes it'll just like, days will go by and I haven't touched it. Like, how did that happen? I have it right there. It's waiting for me. So it's like building these habits. I think it's the hard part. Yeah, like I like to tell people like, was it 168 hours in a week? 168 hours a week, you sleep 40, that's 128, work 40. You still have 80 hours work left, right? But like you said, so many people get off work, you know, they probably stop somewhere to get a drink at a bar go home, cook dinner, watch two or three movies, TV shows, and then before you know, it's like, it's midnight, and it's the same routine yeah. over and over again. And, and, and like, you know, like, like people tell me, like, Jason, you have, you have your, your, your startup, you have a podcast, you're doing the Bunker Lab stuff, how you have time, like, I know people do way, way more than me, right? They're like, I mean, Elon Musk is a perfect example, right? Of course, he's like a superhuman, of course, you know, all the stuff <laughs> he's doing, right? Gary Vaynerchuk, Joe Rogan, you know, all these examples out there, people doing more and more stuff, you know, it's... Like, so you got to get, like, get out of that comfort zone and enjoy life, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's possible for everyone. You just have to like schedule it and like make a commitment because it's not like they are a superior race of person that's just able to manage more things. It's just they're not watching TV much. <laughs> yeah, and they're yeah, focused, yeah. So are you, how many hours of sleep do you get a, get a day? What's your average? I used to sleep a lot more and then I started hosting dogs on the Rover app because obviously the pandemic and we can't go anywhere. There's nothing to do. So I decided to just house dogs for people. And so they wake me up at like eight o'clock now, which sounds late now that I'm saying it out loud, but usually my schedule is like, I will work until like two or 3 AM and then get up at like nine or 10. Okay. Now it's sort of shifting because of the dogs. Yeah, for me, my, my sweet spot is seven hours. I can sleep six hours sometimes, but yeah. But I've always been jealous, you know, those people out there who like sleep. Like, I have a good friend, Kiyoki. I mean, he sleeps four hours a day. That's it. If he goes to sleep at 10 p.m., he's up at 2 a.m. He goes to sleep at 2 a.m., he goes, wakes up at 6 a.m., right? His whole life is on home, and it's like 25, 30 years. But no matter what, if he's been out drinking, whatever, it's four hours for him. I was, I've always been jealous of people like that, right? Like, I think all the stuff you can get done is always got extra hours. I don't know. I feel like that's going to come back to bite him one day. I mean, he's been doing it since he's been like, <laughs> yeah. So four hours is not a lot. Yeah. So you recently finished uh, the bunker last program called veterans and residents, correct? Yes. LA. Can you, can you talk about that process and how that was for you? It was great. It was really like, I think there's a lot of like startup accelerator type programs that are really geared towards like help you get, funding and prepare you to become like a unicorn 
but Bunker Labs wasn't like that. Bunker Labs was really like, how do we help you, you know, mature as an entrepreneur? How do we give you the resources that you need? And everybody's company is different. So we will help each of you in a different way. And that's the kind of you know, feedback and, and resources I got from Bunker Labs. Uh, because I did another accelerator program called Startup Boost, which was great. It was amazing. I made amazing connections. But the main focus of it for six weeks was pitch. Just pitch over and over, refine it, refine it, pitch, 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 pitch. And we didn't do any like business development or anything. Like yeah, there's a lot more to a business than pitching. Yeah. Like, like I'm yeah. the VR leader here in Seattle. Uh, and I, I would tell people like the challenge for, for the VR is a good thing or a bad thing, like you're saying, like, like, um, like accelerator, like tech stars or YC commoner, it's the same thing. Tech starters come in, they're the same level. They teach them how to pitch, you know, MVP is rinse and repeat over and over again. With, with Bunker allows the VR rework is like all these different businesses, right? You know, it might be a, a company like yours, might be a nonprofit, might be a marijuana app. It might be someone's idea. So how do you like, you know, yeah. mentor all those people, so to speak, you know, so it's definitely a challenge, but I, I definitely agree with what you say though. Yeah. It's not easy handling all these different businesses, but you know, they're making it work. And I really felt like I got a lot of it. That's, that's good. So you've had many um, companies, start several companies, and I believe you have what I call the startup bug, entrepreneurial bug. How did you catch this entrepreneurial bug? Did you have it in the Air Force, or you caught it during the, your sales career, or how did this come about? Um, well, I would say it's because of my parents. My dad was an entrepreneur, and his business was flipping businesses, so he would buy distressed businesses and improve them. So over my life, he had probably like 20 something different businesses. And I was helping him as much as I could as I grew up. Um, and then my mom obviously didn't want me to do any business because she was so stressed out all the time. Um, and so I went into the military, but I still had that spirit of like, I want to make something, I want to create something. So I actually started this thing which was a great learning experience and a total disaster, which is, you know, like military performance reports. Mm -hmm. and they're very like, like top down, like your, your commanding officer or your superior officer will rate you on like a different form. Sometimes you'll write it, fill it out yourself, right? And then give it to them to sign. But um, I felt like in true egalitarian fashion, it should go both ways. And commanders should be rated by all of their subordinates too. Oh, man, if only it worked like that. <laughs> oh man. Oh man, that would have been perfect. If it's only though, like you can't it is. from top down because there's you know there's too much power there. Um, so I made this website, anonymous website. I don't know if you heard of like ratemyprofessor.com yes. back in the yes. day. And so it's kind of like that, but for officers and I made it anonymous. Yeah, I'm sure your command officer loved, would have loved that. <laughs> well, so she called me into her office one day. She's like, did you make this? And I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> She's. She thought I made it to like talk about her specifically mm -hmm. as if I like have some vendetta against her. But like, I didn't do it for that reason. I thought it would just be good for us to have like a two way system of evaluating each other. So she told me to turn it off, which I did immediately. And that was the end of that. I mean, maybe you can use it like it does in the real world, you know, I mean, I mean, how many, like, not in the military, but how many people would love to write the boss, you know, and give the boss like, you know, actual feedback. Yeah, I think there is a website that's kind of like that right now. But I think this sort of like evaluating thing has just like always followed me in my interest. And that's why like for filmocracy, we have this complex rating system. Um, but yeah, like this entrepreneurial bug definitely comes from my dad. And, but I think the difference is he liked buying existing distressed businesses and making them better. And I'm more about making something new. Okay. So for your platform, so two part question. First part is a question you want everyone to you know, be on your platform, but is there a certain demographic you're targeting and follow up? Are you finding that there's, there's actually a certain demographic that's on your platform? Yeah, it's, it's always hard when you're like a two-sided marketplace and who are you catering to? Ideally, we're catering to the customer who's watching these movies, but my motivation is actually helping the suppliers, the filmmakers. 
And so what we're finding on our platform is that actually filmmakers are drawn much more to the platform as consumers and as the supplier. So those are the ones that are the most active. They're rating a lot. They're watching a lot. They're leaving reviews, like written reviews. We allow that. So it's a work in progress, but the people that have been most active and interested have been like the film community. And how many people are, are you on your team right now? 15 people. Oh, that's a pretty decent number. And yeah. all, all of them are in the LA area? No, they're all spread out. There's some in like Australia and New York and Warsaw and Poland. So it's like all over. We all, all work remotely. Um, and everybody's working on this like in their spare time, except for me and, and some of the other co-founders. Um, because we haven't raised any institutional funding yet. So everybody's just working in spirit and, and belief. So that makes a good point. How do you convince people to quote unquote work for free until you get money? I mean, for people, I mean, cause that's not easy to do, right? Like on, on my stuff, I'll tell people, Hey, I'm gonna give you X amount of money in the company. However, comma, you know, that's the same as me telling you the pot of gold that the rainbow is here, right? It's probably not going to happen. So, I mean, I think I'd be realistic also to kind of be like, you know, the, the cheerleader, right? Oh, the money is just around the corner, right? So how do you balance all that, you know, like be fair and equitable with everyone and not, you know, quote unquote, try to be like one of those, there's a lot of founders out there, you know, come work for me and I give you some money or equity and, you know, they're, they have an ill intent in their heart, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I'm very egalitarian and I want everyone to have their fair share. So um, in terms of getting people to work for free, it's, it's, a lot, it's kind of sales. But also, I'm very lucky in the sense that this is an industry that people are. Very passionate about. So a lot of tough of a sell to tell them, hey, we're going to be bigger one day. Um, and until we get there, if you help, you know, you'll be rewarded handsomely in the future. And of course, the fact you're in LA versus, you know, Lincoln, Nebraska has to be a full, huge benefit, I would think. But I'm pretty sure you started. It makes a big difference. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you started coming to LA for a reason. Yeah, yeah, it's, it just gives you some credibility that you're serious, which is unfortunate. You know. So, what's, um, so talking about remote work. So, I'm a firm believer that remote work is great, but remote work is not for everyone, right? What's your process of like you talk to someone, in, or like an a, a employee, or whatever, potential employee? determine is this person can actually handle remote work and it's a match for them and you? Mm. I would probably ask them how much they like being in isolation or how much energy they derive from being around other people. Um, because if you're working at home by yourself, that can be really hard for some people and also very easy for some people. So I just have to figure out like, are they the type of person that can thrive in a remote environment, uh, only communicating through Slack and like video chat once in a while. Uh, but I would also recommend that they find a way to separate their space. Um, That's a good point. This part is only for work. This part is only for life. Uh, because once it starts blending, then you lose the sense of like division. And even in your brain, you start to feel less, less control over the organization of it. So having a sense, uh, a different space for each place is, is very helpful. So Paul, what advice do you have for new entrepreneurs out there who are just getting, getting started? Biggest piece of advice would be to just do it because you're probably going to fail the first few or not be that successful with the first few. And so if you're going to be successful one day, you have to start now. You have to start getting those notches on your belt. You have to start learning from failures. You have to start learning from other people's mistakes and meeting people because your idea, whoever you are out there that you have right now, may be a great idea. But an idea is only a multiplier and it's really about execution. So you have to start learning how do you execute? How do I take whatever the idea is from step one to step two to step three? Uh, and also be able to like get better and better at that process each time. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, like, you know, a lot of people, they'll use like Joe Rogan and Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, like entrepreneurs and, you know, they have everything going on. 
But if you go back to Gary Vee's first YouTube video on one library and Joe Rogan's first podcast, it's like nowhere mm-hmm. close to what is today, right? I mean, it's like so horrible. I mean, in, in a good way, of course, you know, because you got to get started. <laughs> but you, I mean, like, like I say, you got to get started. You got to just, and yeah, I think Everybody you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. So, Paul, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, I'm really frustrated by how diverse our social media handles are. But, um, you know, there's another organization called Filmocracy. So don't get confused, everyone. On Facebook, we have Filmocracy. But on Instagram, it's my Filmocracy. And on Twitter, it's Filmocracy too. We are the worst. We're trying to fix it. But these people are not, not playing ball. So this is what we have right now. Um, but I think going to our website is just the easiest thing to do because all our social media handles are there. And that's right. filmocracy.com. And how are you utilizing your social media? Like, are you like doing like little short videos on there or destructive videos? Or how do you use it, like, utilizing social media? Uh, luckily, we have an amazing social media manager. Her name's Nikki, and she like comes up with, she's like really become the voice of filmocracy on social. And luckily she's very funny and clever and like has great design aesthetic because before her, if you like scroll to like the beginning of our social media feeds, it was just me basically trying to like just put content up and like memes and like cartoons that I, or memes that I made or pictures that I found and it's not good. So don't do that. Don't scroll to the beginning, but it's (laughs) uh, definitely find someone who, who is more passionate about social media than I am. And for our listeners, we're going to have the links to our social media in the show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends. So, Paul, what's the vision for your company? The vision, I was just talking about this with one of my co-founders the other day of, like, what can this be? And what I hope is... Independent film and film in general is very like concentrated. Like Hollywood is like this big and they have a lot of power, 95, 99% of the power. Then you have all the independent film on the outside, outside outskirts trying to break in. And what I would like is to bind everything together into like an alliance organization of, you know, filmmakers, theater chains, film festivals, like everything banded together. So we're not like fighting with one another or competing with one another per se, but instead we're competing against the studios and the Netflixes and like these big corporations because individually, you know, we're not so strong, but together we make something very exciting and powerful. And you could say like an analogy is, you know, like Amazon came up and they were just initially products from random sellers. And you would say, well, Walmart is all in one building and they have all this stuff, professional, high quality delivery. And you realize like over time, like the power of all these sellers from all over makes something really cohesive and amazing given the right platform. And so I would hope that we can be something like that, except not evil like Amazon. (laughs) So like, um, I, if you like for professional sports, like football, basketball, baseball, like a very low percentage of athletes who start high school athletics, make the pros. Is it the yeah. same low percentage for like actors? Like, you know, you know, you have all these actors or like in drama, you know, drama class in high school. I'm assuming like a very low percentage actually become like quote unquote movie stars, right? Whatever you think that percentage is, is less. Okay. You have better odds. My friend told me this stat. Um, you have better odds of getting into the NFL than being a paid Hollywood writer. I did not know that. I thought it would be the other way around. Yeah, I mean, NFL is like, that's an exclusive group of very strong dudes. And like, everybody feels like they can write, but no, you can't. You can't write like the way that you need to write. It takes a lot of experience and education and networking to get to that point. And the next question for you, so you have like people who are like say are Hollywood actors and people on Broadway. Are those the same type of acting skills, same type of skills as a different, there's just two different genres all together. Cause, you, Cause I can't think of any, like any like actors or Broadway stars or vice versa. No, they can definitely cross over if they, okay. if they want to. Okay. So Paul, what kind of talk? Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? 
uh, wisdom or advice? I would say be woke. You know, we are in a very interesting time in history and there's so much disinformation out there. Oh, Maybe yeah. the stuff that I'm reading is not the right information, but all we can do is keep like learning, keep trying to figure out more stuff, keep trying to become more aware of what, what the world is about, because I think we're, we're slowly becoming this dystopian future that we love to make movies about, and we kind of laugh it off, but it's also not that funny that this is happening. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. Hey, Paul, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.